Hello, San Francisco. Yeah, good. Okay, it's 10.45, so might as well get started. Um, hello? I'm Richard, and I'm going to talk about the OpenStreetMap community, how it works, and what we can learn from how it works. Now, I have to give you a big introductory health warning to this talk, and in fact, anything else that I do, which is that I am an arts graduate, and therefore this talk is not going to have facts or statistics or anything inconvenient like that, but it's going to have lots and lots of really good hand-wavy generalizations. So if you like hand-wavy generalizations, this is the right talk to be in. If you want these sort of inconvenient facts things, then you might want to go and listen to the National Park Service next door. It's also it's really nice to be here in, um, as you can probably tell from the accent, I'm from England. It's nice to be here in the land of the free, the land of the rugged individualist and all of that. But, you know, to sort of bring um, people closer together, I thought I would like to give you a bit of good old-fashioned European socialism. So we'll start with this. This is an advert from about 20 years ago for a British trade union. to park keepers, from librarians to meals on wheels. If you want to be heard, speak in unison. Now you might be wondering why on earth I showed you that, and it's actually just because just I like the animation mostly. Um, but it's, al it's also because I think that's sort of how people think about OpenStreetMap, that, you know, we're these sort of little worker mapper ants, and the ants don't really matter on their own, no one notices the ants on their own, but when we work together we do something great and we fight them off the big bear, and the big bear might be, I don't know, TomTom uh, Tom or Google or whoever it is. Um, and that used to be how I thought about OpenStreetMap, but then I started noticing um, this is Potlatch's history feature. And you look at the history for something that's been edited, and I started not noticing I'm seeing the same names quite a lot of the time. That it's not, you know, it's not this huge mass of worker ants, that there's some really, really big ants out there. Um, so I'm start starting to think, okay, maybe this doesn't quite work as I thought it did. And then then I read a book, and reading a book is really bad news for sort of impressionable people like me, because I tend to believe everything they say. But uh, this is this book called You Are Not a Gadget, which is where I've nicked the um, name of the talk from, and it's by that chap there who's called Jaron Lanier, and I have absolutely no idea what he's playing, but I want one. Uh, and he's it's, it's quite interesting. He's basically... He's very critical of the way that the internet's developing. He's very critical of the way that we're sort of becoming these individualized atoms of data that then get aggregated by Google and such like so they can sell ad campaigns against them. And, you know, you, you see something like that. He, he wants to sort of bring back the human, bring back the personal into things. Uh, that's from his latest book, which is making a similar point. Um, that's a review of You Are Not A Gadget. And so, you know, I'm reading this and I'm sort of nodding my head because I believe everything I read. And I'm thinking, you know, this, this is great, I agree with this. Um, but then, you know, he's talking about crowdsourcing here and he's saying, you know, crowdsourcing is bad news. It's subsuming individual creativity into this one big faceless work. You know, we don't like this. And I'm thinking, yeah, 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 I agree with that. Hang on, hang on, no, I do OpenStreetMap and I like OpenStreetMap, I enjoy it. And this guy's smart and he's saying crowdsourcing's bad. So, you know, what's going on here? Am I in the wrong project? And so I started to sort of ask myself, who are we? Why are we doing this? And uh, this guy called Steve Coast got interviewed recently and someone asked him, uh, who are you? Why are you doing this? And it's a really good answer. Uh, he's saying this is his description of who OpenStreetMappers are, and I've picked out the last sentence there. OpenStreetMap can be seen as the sum of the personal interests of all the participants who want to see them recorded on the map. That, that's, not a bad, that's not a bad description of who we are as mappers. Another quote that came out about the same time was uh, Martin Van Exel writing on the US talk list, and uh, there you go. this is a statistic, this is a rare thing in this talk, a real actual statistic. 5% of the mappers create 80% or more of the map data. 
and we actually saw that yesterday. We saw that this is from the uh, Mapbox data report. 92.36% um, of changes submitted by pretty much 5% of users. So that's interesting. And we put those two things together, Steve's quote and this 592% number. And you start to work out maybe how OpenStreetMap works. That contributions are coming, this 92% is coming because people are passionate. Because they're passionate about their personal interests, as you put it. Some people are passionate about their city, about their neighbourhood. Some people are passionate about cycling, like I am. Some people are just passionate about OpenStreetMap. So maybe it's not like the ants. Maybe we're not all worker ants. Maybe our contributions are significant on their own. And so I start to sort of reread this book of Jaron Lanier's with slightly different eye. And I think, you know, He's saying that crowdsourcing is diminishing the individual. Well, maybe it is in some context, but not in OpenStreetMap. Um, I think at its best, OpenStreetMap's the opposite. It's empowering the individual, that we're providing this enormous freeform canvas on which you can record what you're passionate about. You know, before OpenStreetMap, geodata was generally about cars and utilities, and now it's about anything you want. It's much more open for people to be creative with. But, I mean, you know all of this. All, all of this stuff about OpenStreetMap is much richer, has been told in a million and one talks over the years, so I won't bore you with that. What you might not know, or what I didn't know, certainly, is who these people are, who the 5% actually are. The power mappers. Now, here we go, mighty morphin power mappers. I think these, these guys are definitely JOSM users, you know, it, it, that's what JOSM users look like, right? Yeah. Actual list of the 40 top users in Britain. This is from the time of the license change. We wanted to know who the top users were so that we could stalk them and get them to agree to the license. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting because I'm looking through this list and I think, who are these guys? I, you know, I know some of them, um, but I, I don't know that many of them. Uh, I've not really met many of them. I think I look through the top 300 mappers in Britain and I've met 25 of them, which isn't that many. Um, most of those names you don't see on the mailing list. If you do, you only see them on the local mailing lists. Most of them aren't members of the foundation. I sort of took that and threw that list against the foundation membership list, and only five of the top 40 mappers in Britain are members of the foundation. So, you know, there are these power mappers, but most of them aren't here. You've not met them. I've not met them. And I was trying to find a good, good analogue for who these guys might be, and uh, this is what I found. If you know this, you can join in, by the way. That's it. That guy there. <laughs> that guy there is OpenStreetMap. He thinks he's in. He thinks he's in the crowd, but actually he's the one who stands out, and he's the one who makes things different. So uh, there you go. If you notice yourself in that, that's good. Now, does this work? Do these five percent, these power mappers, work? Well. They really, really do. This is from Ito World's um, completeness metric that they do for the UK. Uh, the blue is where 95% of the roads are mapped, or 95% or more, in a particular area. I mean, look, we finished Britain. This is amazing. 5% of mappers have pretty much finished Britain. The same is true in Germany. Germany's pretty much done. France is getting towards being done. Russia is getting towards being done. So, you know, you can map a country with these guys. It's really, really good stuff. And obviously, the approaches are different. In France, they do mapping differently to Germany. Um, the countries themselves are different, you know, Britain and Russia are about as different as you could get, but the common factor is dedicated contributors who put the hours in. And you know, that's not just true of mapping, that's true of developers, that's true of cartographers, anyone who volunteers for OpenStreetMap. But I think over the years, a few myths have sort of developed about these guys, and um, so I want to sort of take a bit of time to debunk some of these myths. Um, just a word of warning, if you're doing a presentation, do, do not source your slides from knowyourmeme.com because it just gives you a headache, really. Um, but, okay, a few myths. One of the myths is that Britain is done because we all go to the pub and we meet up in pubs. And, you know, here we are, mappers in pubs. There are a few of them I might recognise around here. Uh, 
And it's great, but actually it's not necessary. Much though I would love to have to go to the pub every day, uh, you don't have to. Because there is a, there's only really, I think, three places in Britain where pub meets happen, which is London, Birmingham and Edinburgh. And yet, you know, the whole of Britain is done. So you can't explain it just by pubs. Uh, it's not just about population density either. You know, uh, this is always the thing. How do we map Ohio? It's big and uh, empty and all that sort of thing. So, you know, we hear this. Population density is a problem for mapping. Well, you might want to talk to the guys who have mapped Russia because they don't seem to have too much of a problem with it. And we're not geeks either. I mean, this is the thing. You know, you sort of think OpenStreetMap is mostly populated by people who go to Linux user groups. Well, you know, that was true six or seven or eight years ago. Um, but this is one of our top mappers in Britain, Jerry Clough, SK53 on OSM. Um, he's not talking to a Linux user group. He's talking to the South Nottinghamshire group of the Wildlife Trust about plants. Um, another one of our top mappers, Chris Hill, uh, he, he doesn't spend his time packaging stuff for Fedora. He spends his time growing asparagus in his allotment. Um, and, you know, some guy here uh, spends his time when he's not doing OpenStreetMap playing the organ, which is a slightly strange thing to do, but, you know, it takes all sorts. And um, as, as the amount of grey hair there can show, you know, we're not all young either. It would be nice if we were. But uh, OpenStreetMap people are not uniformly young. They're not, you know, they're, they're not sort of these anti-business hippies, which is this idea that's come up sometimes. Um, a, lot, a lot of the people I, I see in OpenStreetMap in Britain are actually, you know, 50, 60 plus. Um, they've retired from a successful career in business. And this is something they do as their sort of retirement hobby. So, you know, we hear these myths, but I think sometimes... Repeating the myths is holding us back. Um, if, if we were as dysfunctional as the myths suggest, then we wouldn't have got the world mapped, and we're getting there quite well. How long do we stay contributing? Well, you know, some of us have, for our many sins, been here forever. I think, you know, sort of, we're coming up to our ninth birthday um, this year. And that's a, it's a lot of your life to spend on OpenStreetMap. But, uh, but also, you know, th there's quite a lot of turnover. Um, JOSM is a good example. Uh, you know, much though I might hate to admit it, JOSM is clearly fundamental to the um, success of OpenStreetMap. Is this talk being recorded? Um, I'm not going to lift that one down, sorry. Um, but, you know, th this is JOSM going through its various maintainers. IMI announces it in 2005. Uh, here it is, JOSM, first thing. Then in 2007, IMI does the open source equivalent of being run over by a bus, which is that he gets a girlfriend and he no longer has time to contribute to JOSM. So Frederick takes over. Um, in 2009, Frederick also gets hit by a bus, or rather he founds Geofabric and he doesn't have time to do so much with JOSM anymore, so he passes it on to Dirk. So this is this key piece of software. People keep getting hit by buses, but actually the software continues. And it's true all through the project. Um, you know, we're now on online editor number four. We had the Java applet, two flavours of potlatch, and we're now with ID. It's true with mapping. Um, Oxford, which is the nearest city to where I live, the blessed town of Shalbury, um, the, the original mappers who did it, they've mostly all gone off, but it's still being mapped because um, new people have come along. And, you know, for heaven's sake, Australia, large parts of the Australian community left because of the licence change. We're already way up um, past where we were pre-license change because the community renews itself. So we're, you know, despite these buses that keep coming along, we're a fairly resilient community. This is what you get if you type Australia bus into Google image search, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, you know, despite people being run over by buses, we, we sort of carry on, um, and that's great. I do know about buses because I am the public transport representative for Charbury Town Council, so I know lots about buses, so that's great. How do these mappers work? Well, you know, a lot of the time it's people working on their own, we know that. But, you know, there's also sort of vague shared aims through informal communication and small groups. We work well in small groups. So, what can we learn from all of these vague, hand-wavy assertions, generalizations that I'm spewing out? Well, we've got this sort of 95% via five, uh, versus 5% thing. And 95%, it's the argument about OpenStreetMap should be easy enough that your granny can edit it. And, you know, I would love granny to be able to edit open... Google image search, sad granny, seriously. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's Creative Commons licensed, even better. You know, there's someone going out there taking pictures of sad grannies. Uh, but the 95%... 
focusing on them, focusing on Granny, will not grow OpenStreetMap to the level we want it, uh, or at least it won't within a reasonable time frame. They will. They keep the existing map fresh. The 95%. You know, they they see things that are wrong and they do little corrections and. These are two places I've lived. The one on the left is a little village called Bisbrook. The one on the right is Charlbury, where I now live. Um, and in both of those maps, you'll see top left, there's a road name called Daglin. Uh, Charlbury, there's one called Workhouse Lane. Both of those were road names that I got from grannies. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to get either Lillian or Leah to go in and edit OpenStreetMap. But, you know, their local knowledge is really important. So it's good to have these. But at at this stage, we want to grow OpenStreetMap. We want to grow it so that we are at least as complete uh, as we are in Germany and the UK, in the whole world. And so to do that, we need the power mappers. We need more of these five percenters. That means we've got to recruit more of them. And just as important, we've got to keep the ones we've got. We don't want to piss off the existing power mappers and have them go off and do something else. So three challenges. How do we get more? How do we retain them? And how do we get the best out of the ones we've already got? And um, because all good things come in threes, we have three answers, and they are reasons. We need reasons for people to contribute. We need resources for them to contribute with, and we need to respect them and their contributions. Reasons. This is Steve's quote again. We d uh, they draw their motivation from their personal interests. Uh, the example I always come back to with this is um, cycling in Britain. There was no cycling map in Britain, basically. No good cycling map, no online cycling map. Uh, and so cyclists sort of um, coalesced around OpenStreetMap as a great platform to build themselves a map. That was, the, that was their reason. They wanted a cycling map, and they went and built it. This is, of course, Andy's Open Cycle Map, which is the thing that sort of really got it all going. And the result of all of this is that we now have really, really good coverage of bike routes. We have really good coverage of bike shops. We have good coverage of pubs. You can see several around there, because cyclists like pubs. Um, some things are not so important to cyclists, so we don't have good li coverage of speed limits, because that's not too much a problem. And... We're not too good on coverage of traffic lights because we're cyclists and we don't care about traffic lights, really. Um, but I think this is the challenge for people who want addressing in OpenStreetMap. You've got, you've got to give people a reason why they want addressing in OpenStreetMap. And thus far, you know, there's already maps out there that are fully addressable. So getting the addresses into there is going to require thinking of a reason why people will want to enter them. Resources. Contributors need reasons, they also need resources, and it's about building the tools so that enthusiasts who have we seen, not just geeks, enthusiasts can map what they want to. And this is why ID is really, really good, because you know, it's, it's so friendly and straightforward that any enthusiast, not, you know, not just a geek, anyone can use it, it's got the lovely walkthrough and all that sort of thing, but like Potlatch has always been, it's a full editor, you can get to, the, you can get to be part of the 5% with ID really, really quickly. And you know, this is Tom's quote the other day about, we hope that ID will increase conversion rates. Absolutely, no, that's what it's all about. It's about getting people in and getting them to be part of the 5% to make serious contributions to OpenStreetMap as soon as possible. And yeah, we, we've seen this before, building the resources, building the tools really helps in getting people to map a particular thing. With the cycle routes, Andy built Open Cycle Map. Dave Stubbs added support for route relations to potlatch one and it happened it sort of becomes this virtuous circle because other cyclists start seeing this they use the data they sign up for open street Batman. this i found on a um british cycling forum and i absolutely love this because this this is how it all works this is how it's all meant to work this guy wants a cycle map for his um little handheld well, his handlebar mounted garmin gps downloads the open street map one i'm very impressed by the osm mapping i seriously doubt i'll revert to the garmin maps the osm maps are so good and then the killer thing is the last line i've signed up as an osm contributor and will add some missing local roads that's pretty and actually the real last line is that he doesn't take unauthorized tea which is a performance enhancing drug uh, you know so that that's good that that's how it works and the um the, the license change, I think, was another good example. If you, if you build the resources, then it happens. Um, with the license change, uh, the reason we got to 99% of the data coming through is because Frederick built this great thing called WTFE, which showed you which data was going to be kept. Uh, Simon Poole did uh, odbl.pool.ch, which was a listing of people who um, hadn't accepted the license yet so that you could stalk them and you know threaten them or whatever we did. Um, and it worked. So again... If you want addressing in OpenStreetMap, that's a really good model to follow. Build the tool. Build the tool that lets you put addresses in. Uh, you know, I think what you'd do is you'd build a little mobile phone app so that I can sort of walk up and down the street and, you know, this place hasn't got an address, tap, 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 and in it goes. Now, I am told 
that um, there are a few app developers, some mobile app developers in town at the moment. So if you want to solve addressing in OpenStreetMap, the really, really easy way to do it is to get $5,000 out of your pocket and sort of hang around outside Moscow and West saying, hey, look, um, you know, uh, build me an app and uh, I'll give you this money. And finally, the last, last of the three is uh, respect. And this is... Um, this is a difficult one. Uh, we, we want to respect contributors, we want to respect their contributions, and sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it really, really wrong. Um, this conference is great. Anywhere where OpenStreetMap people meet up in the flesh works really well. Uh, and there's some of our existing um, communication channels that work well. IRC is really friendly. If you, if you have a look at the quotes page on the wiki, uh, people on IRC are just having a good time. Uh, and it's, it's a nice way of doing it. And, you know, we do some things really nicely. This is a, a guy who wanted to um, contribute a big chunk of code, Pavel Pavrota, and this is what he said, you know, um, I've encountered people and they're re really supportive and open to changes. So we can get it right, but, you know, the mailing lists, um, this conversation I had with Gary Gale from Nokia about the mailing lists and the reputation of the mailing lists, it's, it's not always good, it's not always good. Um, I saw this, this was on some comments thread on some of the... Um, uh, positive press coverage we've had recently. Some poor guy used to used to be a power mapper. Look, he's spending four or eight hours a week on OpenStreetMap, and automated edits basically killed his enthusiasm. He says, seeing a majority of my work vanishing after a few months, I just gave up. We shouldn't be doing this. Um, we have to give people respecting people means giving them straight answers to easy questions. Now. If you go to the wiki, click Beginner's Guide and Edit Maps, which is an easy question, this is the straight answer you get. You know, what on earth are we doing with this? Um, we really, really need to sort this sort of stuff out. But y you haven't come here to listen to me complaining, so I shall stop complaining. Um, I would like to be positive, so we shall have some nice positive suggestions about what all of this tells us about how to grow OpenStreetMap. Find enthusiasts. Enthusiasts work. We've seen that. So find communities that have got reasons to contribute. Give them the resources to contribute. Um, we've heard already this weekend Foursquare Super Users. Really, really good example of a community with reasons to contribute. This, uh, this is just a little fixation of mine. Um, this is a particular type of Welsh architecture. Uh, chapels, which were a big thing in Welsh culture, late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, there are people who are interested in this. I'd love to have them go around and map them all on OpenStreetMap because there's no documentation about where they all are. Uh, and supply the resources. The resources for this might just be, you know, um, edit a preset so you can click here, it's a chapel. Suggestion number two, small groups. Small groups work. Um, it's, if you give people a friendly way to communicate within small groups and help each other, then they do, they start building the map and it's a really, really efficient way of building the map. And we've sort of seen some big proposals for redesigns and new looks and that sort of thing. This is just a little idea I've had. I would love to have a sort of a group stroke project feature on OpenStreetMap so that you could join a group, you could say, you know, these are where my diary posts are going, the, I'm going to tag change sets with this is part of this project that I'm doing. And you know, it brings people together, it gets people a nice approachable place to contribute to. Um, and because you can get very hand wavy, I thought I would give you some actual code. This is not a working patch because we use Active Record, and Active Record gives me a headache, so it is in Data Mapper. But I mean, that is just, you know, th that's a data model for a project. It's quite simple stuff. And if you've read the abstract for this, it says my talk will give you the ultimate answer to life, the universe, and OpenStreetMap mailing lists. And some of you might have turned up for that, so uh, with no further ado, um, it, you know, this isn't like 42. This is the real answer to happiness in OpenStreetMap. <laughs> it really works, it really works. Um, but no, seriously. Uh, Suggestion number three, keep op OpenStreetMap strong with more respect. Um, that's a very wishy-washy thing to say. So. Uh, you know, okay, we're not Wikipedia. Wikipedia loves its policies. We don't need 5,000 policies. But we could possibly just do with some really, really simple standards how to behave. Um, don't be a jerk is the standard thing. But, you know, let's, let's have one policy for don't be a jerk on the mailing list, the diary, that sort of thing. Nice, simple policy. One policy that says, you know, this is how imports work. Because at the moment we've got three and they're sort of a bit contradictory and a bit in. Uh, unequally applied and a, a policy to sort of mediate the relationship between the foundation and the community because there's a lot of mistrust and confusion about that. 
Um, you know, it, it's very easy to knock imports, and I, I knock imports all the time. It's a cheap joke. But, you know, uh, those of us who've been around a while, actually, we've got a bit of a responsibility there. We have not done a good job of explaining to well-meaning people who want to import data why they've got to do it properly and what doing it properly means. Um, doing it properly means bracing your ship. And let's stop bike shedding. Let's stop niggling about every single little thing. You know, this, this is San Francisco. It's all about chilling out a bit. So let's, um, let's stop that. So that, that's my main message, which is enthusiast, respectful environment, keep open street map fun. I've got a little postscript. That, that's the body of the talk, but I've got, I've got a little postscript, which is that um, some of you, especially if you're sort of here for the three-day thing, will have noticed that I haven't really mentioned how the community and business inter uh, interact. And I think that's because there aren't really any special rules that um, business interacts with the community the way that the community interacts with itself. You know, it's all about respect. It's all about providing resources. Um, and I'm sort of going through a lot of this myself because when I came to Portland, I was talking as the maintainer of OpenStreetMaps Online editor at the time, Potlatch, and the guy who just sort of kicked off the effort on the next one, ID. Uh, and I did OpenStreetMap in the spare time, and now I'm actually coming at it from the other side. I'm basically working on a little startup which uses OpenStreetMap data. It's, you know, it's not an OpenStreetMap company, but it uses OpenStreetMap a lot, and the better, the better OSM data is, then the better my company will do. So you know, that's, that's all great. Uh, I'm very lucky because my startup is about cycling. Um, we're good for cycling already. And that's because over the last nine years, cyclists like me and like thousands of others have put the hours in. But really, don't believe anyone who might tell you that the community as it stands already is anti-business, because we're not. I see this. You know, There's already several cycling businesses like Cycle Streets, Mio make GPS units, and they ship uh, OpenStreetMap data on it. Um, the community loves them. People are really, really happy to see their mapping being used. So the OpenStreetMap community, I think, loves business. And like all good love affairs, it works much better if the love is reciprocated. There you go. This is successful businessman. He says, I should buy a boat. Well, I already have a boat. And if you come to the state of the map in Birmingham, the big international one, you can come and have a ride on it. Thank you very much. I think we've probably got a minute or two for any questions or general disagreement, if anyone has any. Hiya. Okay. Uh, excellent. Okay, that, that was, that was a, a, well, not a question, but a comment that there's a address collecting app already out there for iOS and Android. It's called OSM Edit, is that right? OSM pad, okay. Brilliant. Okay, well let's let's do something like rename it to OpenStreetMap Surveyor or something, get it in the app store so people search for it and yeah, that'd be great. Hiya. Okay, uh, the question was are the power mappers the ones who are creating community? I think they are and they aren't. It's quite interesting. Um, I'd like to do actual proper research with statistics and stuff into this. Um, that you know, We have this sort of 5%, 95% divide. I suspect, and I don't know, I suspect that the top 1% within that 5% you know, the, are the loners, the people who just sit there and edit all day and trace stuff and all of that. And I think probably the, sort of the 2 to the 5% is where you get the community. But that's complete supposition on my part. I don't know. I'd be fascinated to find out. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Oh no, one sorry, one more Alisa. <laughs> Go on. Okay, um Yeah, the the question is um are the findings specific to Britain or does it translate elsewhere? Um I think the British and the German communities are actually pr pretty similar. Uh, that might be the first time in history that's ever happened. But I think we have basically mapped Britain and Germany pretty much the same way. Um, France is finding its own way through because you know that they've got they've got a slightly different way of doing it. They have this particular um, building import which they're all very big on. But there's a community developing there as well. So I, I think in these places it's fairly similar. Yeah. Well, the, the US, of course, the US is the difficult one because of Tiger, and 
I don't know if people know to what extent the Tiger import has affected how the community is built. I think the, the other challenge in the US is that it's been slightly, not broken, but slightly perverted by some people who are really, really aggressive with their edits and have done these great big massive uh, country spanning edits and that has an effect on the community. Um, I, w I would hope that um, people aren't too put off by that, but I am a bit worried that they are. Okay, my time really is up now. Thank you. <laughs>